Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Tuesday Night Lecture Series, sponsored by the Natalie and James Thompson Gallery at San Jose State University. Tonight, we're delighted to host Suhi Kang and Patrick M. Leiden. The artists will speak for about 40 minutes, and we'll have a Q&A session after. Please post questions to the Q&A function below at any time. Suhi Kang is a Korean herbalist and editor. She traveled throughout the Middle East and Asia to engage traditional ways of living, winning the Istanbul Cultural Center Travel Photography Grand Prize. She studied journalism at Sung Kun Kwan University and is a certified herbalist. Patrick M. Leiden is an American ecological writer and transdisciplinary artist. He is founder of City as Nature and arts editor at The Nature of Cities. In addition to his nomadic studies with farmers, forests, and monks, he studied at San Jose State University, Aichi University of Art, and the University of Edinburgh. For the past decade, Kong and Leinen have worked internationally to produce ecological art and media projects that inspire insightful, empathic relationships between people and the living world around us. Their 2016 art documentary, Final Straw, Food, Earth, Happiness, has been translated into seven languages screened thousands of times, and is part of the Buchanan Prize winning Global Environmental Justice Collection. In 2017, they moved to Osaka, Japan, where they opened the branch Ecological Art Lab in Pocket Farm. And now, please give a warm welcome to Suhi Kang and Patrick and Lyne. There we are. Th uh, thanks for the beautiful introduction, Elena. Good to see everyone. I'm gonna uh, figure out the uh, screen sharing thing. Can you all see the slide? Okay, yeah, good, okay. Yeah, we can see the slide. Thanks, Victoria. So uh, Sue, he asked me to say the first word so that she uh, can be more relaxed. So uh, as uh, Elena noted, I was a student at San Jose State um, uh, some number of years ago. I forgot how many. <laughs> and uh, so it's really nice to to, to be here. Um, Robin Lasser, who is uh, one of the panelists uh, here, was one of my professors for the uh, Image and Idea class. And uh, I always really liked this lecture series when I was a student. Um, it was always really inspiring. And so it's really cool to be back um, and be able to do the lecture. Of course, we don't they have the gallery openings usually so you know um when these lectures happen <clears throat> and of uh that's all part of the fun so hopefully we resume these in-person things um soon huh so he and i are going to talk a little bit about um kind of our path in the past 10 years of working together and uh kind of what we learned and uh and why we started this work, yeah. So let's see if these slides are advancing. Suhi, you you go first now. Okay. Yeah. Hi, I'm Suhi, and that's my picture. Uh, can you imagine where? <laughs> yeah, when I think of my university life, I don't have many memories, sadly, unfortunately, but I travel a lot and I thought oh, that affect me a lot. So somehow I chose <laughs> Middle East area for my first backpacking traveling and the picture from uh, east part of Turkey. And I worried a lot. Many people worried me a lot too. It's very dangerous country. Uh, woman alone, how can you travel? Everyone concerned and I concerned, but I want to explore some 
new thing I never um, seen. So I went there and realized it. Wow, people here are so very happy mm. and very relaxed. And everyone wants to share something. Every day I had free tea and free food. <laughs> so yeah, that's very, yeah, looking back my university life and after uh, 10 years we've been, that experience affects me a lot. You can share even small thing with the people and you don't need to follow the way people always talk to me. <laughs> yeah, so I was a very normal student. I went to um, normal, my, I, my uh, major is journalism. I studied about newspaper and broadcasting and I felt, oh, I don't know. I want, I, I want to follow my Mm, feeling I want to be I want to do something meaningful so after the traveling and some other experience I got a job in a small publishing company so that's <laughs> my work I made the books about environment um, eco lifestyle so this is a cotton pad <laughs> yeah I took picture because I was good at photography so to picture and my main job was book editing about the ecological books. Mm. So it was a very good job, small company with good co-workers. I did a very happy job in Seoul, Korea. But uh, again, more and more after uh, two, three years working in office, I felt, wow, I'm uh, talking about nature and ecology, but actually my personal life was not close with that. Uh, from 8 a.m. to 10 p.m. I worked a lot in office, no sunshine. <laughs> so um, I was thinking about what's a good way, what's a good life. So I joined, <laughs> this is a very beautiful scene of our, my friend's farm. So I joined the weekend farming club. So every Sunday, every um, weekend, we, my friends joined the farming club. We did organic farming in Korea, outside of Seoul. That was a really good experience. It's not only farming, also social campaign because okay, the act activism, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the area was included, the four rivers, very big development plan. So we were against the plan because they want to, the government want to lead uh, development, the farm area. So we did the campaign in this is a subway. <laughs> we, we sold vegetable in the subway to raise awareness of the of the government plan yeah yeah that was very happy <laughs> happy walk <laughs> this is the this is how korean people protest they do something beautiful to show here's the beautiful thing that's going to be taken away you know instead of attacking they show something beautiful that's i was really impressed by your subway vegetable selling campaign <laughs> Yeah, so that was 10 years ago. I was still in my publishing company and I was thinking, how can I live my life? And at that time I met Patrick. So he contacted me and we went to farm together. And yeah, this is a farmer we met through farming club members. Does anyone know what this is? Um, Robin, no, maybe you don't. It's Korean rice wine. They drink in these little bowls. So this is part of the farming culture, you know. Yeah, Every hour drinking. you take a break and drink rice wine. That's really good. <laughs> I don't know if we're allowed to say that, but. <clears throat> yeah, this is Patrick, so I invite him. I, uh, tomorrow I go to my farm at 7, 7 a.m. Can you join? I didn't expect, but somehow he came. I didn't, ex I'm not a morning person, so I didn't expect either, but somehow I got up. <laughs> I guess that's a good lesson to get up early, because if I, if I didn't get up early, I wouldn't have met Suhi, and, I, and then we, we probably wouldn't have Oh. been married and working together for the past so you should get up early <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so mm, that's 
yeah that is our first time but yeah somehow we talked a lot i remember whole day we talked about our life so many similarities we had because we were thinking same thing how we live uh how we live happily yeah so we were looking for the answer mm, together <laughs> i'm playing flute in the picture i was although i i majored in design and photography i was uh in the the band at San Jose State, the marching band and the uh, wind ensemble at San Jose State too. There's so many nice nice things to take part in. Um, the, they call me the kids in Korea. They really are like interested in my beard because not a lot of people have beards there. And they call me Susami Ajeshi, and I ask, ask Suhi, Suhi, what does Susami Ajeshi mean? Susami means dishwashing sponge. Dishwashing sponge. <laughs> Ajeshi's uncle. Uncle. So, so they called me dishwashing sponge uncle because the beard, <laughs> the beard looks like the dishwashing sponge that they use. <laughs> hey, Susami. <laughs> Susami Ajeshi. This might be familiar to some of you, maybe. <clears throat> um, this is San Jose, kind of, I think, right where 101 and 280 um, meet, kind of near the university. Um, you know, when, when I was young, uh, growing up, a lot of the stuff in this picture was orchards, trees. Um, and San Jose was known as the for many years as the prune prune capital of the world. Incidentally, I really liked prunes when I was young too, when I was a kid. Um, but all that stuff is kind of gone. We have we have Apple apples now, Apple, Apple computer now, but we don't have many uh, orchards left that I know of, even though there's lots of streets named after orchards. Um, so when I was growing up, I had the same kind of mm, dis discomfort, I guess, with, uh, with the way that, you know, society was working. And I felt like I didn't fit in and I didn't like agree with what was, with how we're building cities, how, how we're living, but I couldn't really explain it. I couldn't really um, understand what that discomfort inside was. So um, when Suhi and I met, we talked really deeply about this. Um, at the time, I was, um, I was a technical writer for, a, I worked in the tech industry for 10 years while I was a student and after I graduated um, and used my photography skills too for the um, uh, the books that we wrote about technology. Um, and also like Suhi, that the job was great and my boss was great and I'm making money and I'm, I'm doing all these things that society's telling me I'm supposed to do. Um, uh, but at some point, I, I guess I should say this at some, at some point I had, um, I had a six-figure salary, which was big, big deal back then. Um, it's not so much now <laughs> in, in the valley. And I had, I was, I had just put a, an offer on a house in San Francisco, and I, I had a, a, a nice car. I had all these things that society told me I had want, uh, I should want, and. I sat down after I put that down payment on the house, put the offer on the house. And I, I thought to myself, I'm like, am, am I any happier than I was without these things? And my answer was no. And as luck would have it, the, the real estate company replied to my offer and they wanted something stupid, like five, they wanted $500 more on, um, like half a million dollar house, right? And I uh, I rejected their counter offer 
because I had that day to think about it. And I, I like, that's this moment where it's like, okay, if I said yes to that, then I wouldn't have done any of the things that I'm doing now because I would have had to have this mortgage and I would, I would have gone into this different path on my life. Um, and that's not to say you shouldn't buy a house, um, but that more that I, I had some discomfort inside of me and I, and I wasn't paying attention to what it was, but this moment made me pay attention to it. And the talk with Suhi made me pay attention to it. And, and then at that point we decided, okay, we, we want to figure out what that discomfort is and try to, to fix it. And, and so we, we went a different path and we started talking with people about the, what, you know, what's the way our cities are built and what's the way that our economy works and what's the way that we grow food and, and, um, we started to try to find answers to, you know, why we feel so uncomfortable about the way we're doing things. Um, I think the next week or so after this little episode with the house happened, I interviewed the director of transportation for the city of San Jose. Um, I was talking with the mayor. I uh, started to, I joined the arts commission for the city. And I started to really get involved in, in those decisions and that process and was able to find out how, um, you know, how those decisions are made, why those decisions are made and, and how we could do it better. Um, so he and I went to a big conference in Korea on uh, the future of sustainable cities and I started writing for a webzine called The Nature of Cities and, and learning um, a lot about this. And it was a really interesting time. This was in 2011. And, and then as part of this inquiry where we're going to meet and ask people questions about how do we live better? How do we have a more ecological way of living, a more sustainable way of living? In that process, we met this man who is uh, Mr. Che. Yeah, his name is Song Hyun Che and his nickname is Keguri in Korean, means frog. frog. Means frog. Uh, our interview with this man was totally different from the interviews we were doing with the, you know, politicians and the sustainable urbanists and these kind of people. Um, this is his farm, his uh, rice farm in the mountains, three hours east of Seoul in Korea. Uh, the way that most of these other people were talking about pro problems, and really when you look at it, the way that most of this sustainability movement is talking about problems, they're, we're so focused on looking at individual problems by themselves and not looking at how they're connected to everything else. So we, I like to picture it, well, like Suhi and I talk about a tree, you know, if, if our society and the way that we're working is a tree, most of our problem solving takes place by saying, oh, there's something wrong with this one leaf. So let's look at this one leaf and ah, oh, yeah, there's a hole and ah, oh, there's a bug on it. Okay, kill the bug. You know, we, we're operating this way, but the problem is not with the leaf. If you look further, you see that it's connected to a branch and that's connected to um, the trunk and to the roots. And that there's this whole uh, circular system. There's this whole ecological system that it's interconnected with. There's life in the soil that supports it. There's millions of microorganisms in the soil. <clears throat> you know, all of this filters down into the water table and the water system, and then it goes out further into the ecosystem, and, and then it all comes back. And then we have to start looking at the whole system. And we they call this uh, systems thinking nowadays, or for a long time they have, but it goes further than just systems thinking. 
um, it, it's about our relationship with um, the environment. Um, and that's the kind of title of this talk. Um, is it, it's about thinking of ourselves as ecological beings, because in reality, we are ecological beings. We are a part of this system. Everything that we do has an effect, you know, on the environment. And we have to start considering how we fit in with this environment um, in a positive way. And I'll go back one. I'll stay on this picture one of the nice tree and the uh, and for for Mr. Che for Gagerty the farmer it was all about relationships it starts from relationships it's a question of how do you build a relationship with the environment and that means you know having a relationship with your food having a relationship with your farmer and the farmer having a relationship with everything that's in that ecosystem with the microorganisms, the bugs, the soil, um, and everything that plays part in making that ecosystem healthy. So this kind of way of thinking really deeply affected us. And it, it really is still the basement of, you know, the question that we ask when we, when we do our work. Um, anyway, back then uh, in 20, 2011, uh, 10, geez, 10 years ago, <laughs> um, uh, people weren't really talking about this and no one was talking about that we could find natural farming or the way that this farmer was talking about um, working with the land. And we talked with so many people and everyone said, oh, yeah, that's totally crazy that you would farm with no chemicals, that you would farm with no inputs, that you would just let nature like do its thing and no have a tea no and killing, don't fight. <laughs> no, no fighting with nature. Yeah. This was totally foreign to people. Um, so we decided to make a film about it because I just I had studied photography and Suhi had studied journalism. Yeah, but he when he suggested let's make a documentary film and I said, Oh no, I don't like a documentary, I don't watch a film. <laughs> Yeah, but he insists this is super necessary and no film there, we can do it. So let's start. start. <laughs> yeah, yeah I'd like to say we're, we are very accidental documentary makers. <laughs> um, but it just seemed that that was the format that that would work. When we did our, this is our storyboard, when we did our storyboarding, um, I was a student in, in Edinburgh and we decided we would, the way I, we storyboard is we would look at all the pieces of the text. We had um, many tens of hours of interviews and we cut um, all of the interesting pieces out of these interviews. And then we put them up on the wall and we started to find what are the connections between all these pieces. And we were doing this kind of in our home. And then I thought, well, why don't we just do an exhibition about it and invite the public to come see it and talk about it and get their feedback. And so that's what we did. Um, we just put up an exhibition at the school and we hosted kind of a, a panel discussion with some food experts and some professors. Um, and that kind of helped us to kind of build a narrative that, um, that, that made sense and we weren't just doing it by ourselves in isolation. Um, it was kind of a collaborative thing with people who came to the exhibition and with, with others, so. Um, and many volunteers we had. We had many volunteers. The film took us four four years. Four years to make uh, of almost basically full time work um, because we we did most of the stuff ourselves and a lot of it was learning. We worked with an animator too named He Young Park and this is her storyboarding process. Um, we we worked with a lot of musicians to do it. Uh, original soundtrack 
This is Windsync, who we're good friends with. It's a woodwind quintet based in Houston, Texas. Um, and so this whole thing kind of snowballed. We never expected to spend four years making a film and then five, six, seven years, you know, touring um, in total to, to tour it and to do all these events for, related to it, but it just happened. Um, and I think it, it just happened because we were, again, we were looking at, Suhi, you like to say, what's our truth inside? And we're, re, we're looking at that and paying attention to that instead of paying attention to, you know, our friends who are like, ah, you guys are going to, gonna quit your life and give away all your things and you're gonna go travel and make a film like you're ridiculous like you've never even done this before there's so many problems that could happen there's so many things you know so you'll you'll get a lot of this if you ever start following your intuition and you'll get a lot of people who are telling you it's crazy and maybe it is crazy um um, so we spent we spent a few years touring the film after that, all through Japan and Korea and U.S. and, US and other Europe. places. We made a short version of the film, um, too, which you can find online. It's called Food, Earth, Happiness. It's free. Um, you can watch it on YouTube. Um, but that went through a lot of film festivals and people really liked it. It's in a... It's in an academic collection now called the Global Environmental Justice Collection that universities use as part of their coursework. Um, uh, geez, Lexus invited in Korea, Lexus invited us to this very fancy event to talk about our film and show our film. Like, I could never imagine this <laughs> um, happening. Um, most of our screenings are like this, actually. It's more comfortable. Someone's cafe. <coughs> <laughs> yeah, through our screening, also we met many good people while, and many good uh, good things happening in local small area. Next picture, yeah, Japan and Korea. And we met so many um, inspiring people doing good things, but mm. we never heard. It's a never on media. Yeah. That's one thing we realized it. Yeah, when when we did the tour and we met well, we met thousands of people on the tour yeah. and we saw so many different communities and you know when you look at the when you look at the news media, when you look at uh, social media, when you uh, watch TV and movies and look at all these mainstream sources of information um you never see this stuff it's you know so much of it is kind of geared towards you know this person versus this person you know this political idea versus this political idea and it's really based on on fighting and based on creating um a lot of it based on creating this competition and what we realized when we started going out to these places while, while we're taking the film into these different places is that there's so many, you know, that the things we see in the mainstream media, that's not the reality of most of the world, actually. The reality of a lot of the world is that people are trying to work together, people trying to build things together, people trying to collaborate, they're trying to do beautiful and good things. But you don't, I mean, those don't sell advertisements. It doesn't, it doesn't sell advertisements for some big global company when you say, um, well, we should, you know, this, this picture is a chef and a farmer who work together. Yeah, you should just work directly with a farmer and uh, make your own uh, small restaurant. I mean, you can't say this because it goes against you know, then you don't have to go to the supermarket. Then you don't have to buy expensive things from a big company. And we're, we realize that this narrative that we see in our lives every day that we're inundated with, um, it's not the reality of 
of um, of a lot of the world. It seems like the reality, but once you get out there and you meet people, um, you realize there's a there's a totally different way of living that's possible. Um, this is a maker of soy sauce in Japan who does it traditionally in in wood vats and he sells it like a wine. He, he has years on his soy sauce. Mm. And it's the most amazing, delicious thing I've ever tasted. And I could never think soy sauce would taste this way. And I thought, wow, you know, the same thing with the food on the farms that we visit. It's like we've been missing out on this whole depth of uh depth of taste and feeling and experience of life because we've been eating at the food from the supermarket every day. And, and because we've been told that, well, the biggest best-selling brand is the best. Okay, sometimes that might be right, you know. Um, I do like McDonald's French fries. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's a lot of things that, um, uh, there's a there's a whole depth to life and to our sense that we're missing out on, um, and yeah. So <laughs> he talked to too much. I talk too much. You take a break. Yeah, I'll take a break. So uh, also, I find to be uh, interviewed a lot more than ten farmers and chef and and yeah. So we. Mm, we felt oh, this is a, what a pity we have a lot of good stories in our hard drive so because my ex job was a book editor I thought oh what about we make a book so we wrote a book together uh, it's based on our film and adding our stories like what we introduced at the beginning so this is a, a book about our film and our journey uh, yeah, right now only available in Korean. Someday we want to publish in English. So that's a book and also it took two years to write and slowly we find our way after long uh, screening tour and long movie making and I said, what's next? What can we do? <laughs> so it's another uh, chapter we saw. So he started art and writing, and I studied something else. I will tell you later. You'll tell later. Mm. Yeah, we we um we we started writing a lot lately, and really realizing that this uh this kind of foundation from the natural farmers that we talked with about relate your what's your relationship with the environment, with um, and what's your what's your truth. You know this this is kind of a foundation of um the way artists approach their work a lot of times too right so it's it's really the way of thinking of the natural farmers is really similar to the way of thinking of artists and um and of the sake maker of uh, the soy sauce maker and all of these craftspeople that we're meeting um they're all approaching their job with the same way of like you know, deeply looking inside. And when you deeply look inside, you realize that you're um, interconnected with all of these other things. And, and um, um, so asking how we can become active participants in that ecological world, how we can be ecological beings. Um, we, we've done a lot of interesting different things with this mentality. We've worked with global conferences. Geez, Robin, you're in this picture. Um, doing art interventions in conferences and trying to get the people to think differently um, and open their minds about what it means to be ecological. This is called the Forum for Radical Imagination on Environmental Knowledge or Ecological Knowledge. Um, it was, we did this in Paris a couple of years back and one of your professors, Robin, joined us for that and for this. Robin joined us for so many great things. Um, a, a festival in Osaka. 
um, where we asked all sorts of artists and musicians and performers to consider the question of what's your relationship with water. And from this question, all of these works emerged and this whole constellation of um, different works um, came together. And workshops and music and all sorts of things. Um, I'm just going to go through these shortly, but if you have questions about any of them, you can ask. This is called, this is called burger eating a cabbage. It's a living sculpture where the burger slowly eats the cabbage. This is a mandala, a leaf mandala of 7,000 leaves. It took about three weeks to build. Um, this is in a gallery in Osaka. Um, this is a, in a Korean exhibition where I gave a canvas to the, a forest, the forest that we're good friends with, and asked the forest to uh, make work, to spend a year making work. Um, and then I held, a, uh, I brought a curator with me from the museum and we, we took the works and put them into uh, gallery and it was not my exhibition it was an exhibition for Gomsil Forest um, so Gomsil Forest was the artist and I was the assistant to Gomsil um, that's called Forest is the artist uh, this is called the Center for Endless Growth it was a kind of a commentary on what it means to have endless growth um, and uh, maybe we talk a little bit about the real-time food project. We're getting close to time. Um, this project was in Osaka. We opened a restaurant and we invited people into the restaurant. We gave them menus, we took their orders, uh, we brought them glasses of water and then uh, the waiters would come back to the to the people and and tell them, well, um, it's going to be about eight weeks until your um, food is ready, so please wait. Um, people were a little bit surprised at that, um, but the reason was because we the food was grown to order, so we had a we would plant their food after they ordered it, and and they have to wait for it to grow. Yeah, the title was the word slowest restaurant because while we were doing the, yeah, it was at the time we were doing film editing and we felt the big problem is we are so disconnected. We don't know the farmer. We don't know how we get food. So we want to uh, reconnect our food and us. Mm -hmm. And also, there are many interesting way we use uh, nature. We show uh, how the food growing. Also, we can um, experience the, the atmosphere of the farm. This is the soil and flower as a natural color. So we did workshop we call natural drawing. So every week we did workshops with the people who came to order the food yeah. to connect them with the, that space where their food is growing making artwork. And after two months, finally, we did the event. Uh, also, we did the natural dyeing. Soil dyeing workshop, all sorts of things. <laughs> then we invited them back. Oh, there's this, then this kid showed up. Um, this kid showed up, by the way. And we didn't know what to do with him. So we gave him a shovel and we told him to dig holes. He was so cute, I didn't want to tell him to go away or that we're busy, but he just dug holes in the garden. You remember him? Kenji. Kenji. Yeah. Nice hair style. And then oh, eventually yeah. we, we had the dinner, um, dinner event and people, everyone came back. 100% of people came back. We didn't expect that. It was really good. Um, we, this is our chef uh, friend, and she's our co-producer of our film, Kauri Suji. 
Um, so she helped us conceptualize this project and do the cooking. And we did the project twice, actually, once in Osaka and once this is in Megijima, a small island for the Setochi, um, related to the Setochi Tree Alley in Japan. And then this is our space in Japan. So after this project, we kind of wanted to settle down more and stop moving around because we we were, uh, you know, basically home. I don't want to say homeless. I mean, we could, we did sleep on the street sometimes and in storage closets and this kind of places, but we didn't have a permanent house for almost seven, five, five, six, five, six, years. Five, six years, and we just we couldn't afford it when we were making the film so we we were always transient we we're always staying in a different place um and so we really craved to have a place and to be able to build um build community and put into you know put into practice all the things we're we've been talking about and learning about so we built this sp space called the branch in osaka we rebuilt it ourselves um, using um, wood that was donated from the Chishima company. Um, and then we held all sorts of events related to, you know, ecological life style, um, international events with different artists from different countries. Um, and of course we made a garden. Yeah, I felt that traveling five years was really good, but we both felt it's a rootless life. And because I, my beginning, I had a really good experience with farming. I wanted to do more farming and I thought, oh, I like it a lot. So that became my job. Yeah, I, I liked it. Yeah, I like tea a lot, black tea, green tea, and I felt, wow. What about I make tea uh, by her? So uh, yeah, that I studied a lot and I thought, well, oh, actually he's doing many artwork, but I feel like uh, I want to do more practical thing. <laughs> Suhi doesn't think she's an artist, but I say she's just a different kind of artist. She just has a different expression than I do. Yeah, so <laughs> actually I prepared this. Hello. <laughs> this is my art. I like something cute. And this is my job. This is my tea packet. <laughs> Happy bear. <coughs> yeah, the name of my uh, hub business is bear and tiger hub. Yeah, so I do my uh, farm, <laughs> hub farm, <coughs> uh, hub drying and blending. I, I'm really happy with this practical and um, yeah, artistic way mm. of doing. Yeah, so I we did many workshop and things in Japan, Osaka. Now we are in Korea and we are looking for our next place. Yeah, our our all of our stuff is still in Osaka, but in our house is there. But we can't we can't go back because of this COVID stuff. So it's a little bit unsettling for us right now. But um, <laughs> I can say we're used to. Um, being uh, moving around and being shuffled around from place to place. So it's um, not so big a deal. I want to kind <clears> of <throat> and bring this to close um, by talking about um, kind of how we apply these, these ideas to our life recently. This is our construction vehicle. Um, it's called a mama chari, affectionately known uh, like as a mama bike in Japan. Uh, it's it's the standard tool for people to get around Japan. We used it to move all of our construction material, almost all of it, um, to the house. This is the street that our place is on in Japan. Um, you can see no room for a car. Um, ev almost everyone gets around on bicycle in these older neighborhoods in Japan. Uh, and things are small. <clears throat> this is the shopping street where we live in Japan. It's a very minor, small shopping street for our neighborhood. Um, 
Um, but then there's over a hundred shops. There's only one little supermarket. We realized a lot of these, this idea of relationships that we were talking about before from the farmers, it applies to everything. If you can do something that's based in having a really good relationship, uh, it's much easier to be ecological. It's much easier to be uh, so socially sensitive, uh, culturally sensitive, uh, because you have direct relationships with people and with the environment and with the materials that you're using. Uh, so we use this question of how do we have relationship with all these things? And smallness is one of the things that kind of forces us to have this relationship, you know. Um, so using a bicycle to get around, you know, having many small shops that are that are run by the people who own those shops. You know, these are, we don't think these are like important in our life. Actually, they're really important. And we, we didn't notice that until we lived in a place like this. Um, that this smallness um, and slowness and attention to details of things and real like deep consideration of the materiality of what we're using to create and of our relationships with people, all these things are really important. Uh, taking time to slow down and notice that uh, one of the early cherry blossom trees is blossoming and making a, making a point to go to the park to check out that tree, you know. Um, being able to be slow and be in nature. These are really important things in our life. Um, I think a lot of the, a lot of us are realizing that, especially now, in the past year or so, um, that that this is very important. I'll end this because we're now pretty over time uh, with a quote from the one of our good friends who um, recently passed away, who's in the film. Um, Larry Korn, who says, once we enter into nature and participate from the inside, instead of as a visitor from the outside, then we'll intuitively know how to make a living in this world, how to feed ourselves and give ourselves shelter in a way which allows other forms of life um, to live. That's a pretty good mantra, I think. And that's where we're gonna close. So thank, thank you, guys. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to both of you for that wonderful talk um, and for really sharing this experience with us in such an intimate way. You know, we don't, we don't always get the wonderful pleasure of having two speakers um, and, and really being able to see through, through their photographs and through what they share, how they've come to where they are right now. And so it's just been really a pleasure to hear both of you. We're joined for the Q&A today uh, by Robin Lasser and Victoria Howell. And I hear that they were both your professors, Patrick, when you were here at SJSU. So that's also really exciting. Um, I invite anyone who's here to post questions in the Q&A function below or use the raise hand as well. And I know that uh, Robin and Victoria probably have a few things they want to say. So if you want to start us off. Victoria, would you like to? Um, you know, I mean, the content of your talk was obviously very interesting and very important, especially now. But my question actually, you know, most of the people I think that are attending this are graduate students who are going to leave school and then have to make choices about how they make their way in the world. And um, so my question actually was, what do you think gave you, both of you, courage to leave your jobs, to leave your income, right, and follow your passion? And sort of part of that same question was, what would be advice that you would give to uh, anyone really, but certainly to our grad students to trust your gut and your heart, despite 
um, all of the other voices telling you that that's crazy. Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> that's a million dollar question. Do you have an idea, CV? I'd say that the process did, I, you know, admit that that process took a long time and that um, <clears throat> you know I, that I did work a normal job for 10 years and make, make money for 10 years like everyone else did. Um, and so I don't know that there's um, that I would advise people to just quit and, and follow their heart all the time, but rather that you know there there is some intuitive way to know when's the right time you know and for me it was like yeah i just reached that moment where i was like okay i have to make this decision what do i believe in and it was very clear that that was the moment you know that i had to make that decision um but I don't know if it works this way for it. I've heard of a lot of people say this similar things that, that, that there's this moment that forced them to make this decision. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's so, it's such a hard, I can talk about for me, but it's a hard question to answer broadly because everyone's experience is different and everyone has different responsibilities in their life. Um, but I would say that, you know, we also have a responsibility as human beings now to ensure that our children and our grandchildren can even live here, right? I mean, it's a, that's a big thing. That's, a, um, I mean, I think that should be our primary focus is thinking about how we ensure that that happens. And most of the time it means you have to doesn't mean you have to stop making money but it means you have to focus on what are the deeper values in life you know and maybe money is part of that some people are good at making money and like making money and that's fine um i don't like money that much <laughs> which is which makes life difficult you know I think a good question is what makes you happy? Yeah, so for me, uh, I like the book, make, book editor, my job, but I didn't like to sit in office all day. <laughs> so I was asking myself, oh, when I feel happy, I, I felt when I'm doing, um, sitting, on my farm, the land, I don't, I didn't wear shoes. I wear my, <laughs> I just walk around. I touch soil. At that moment, I felt so comfortable, very comfortable with the nature, with the good friends. That uh, experience stayed in my mind a lot. So when I made the decision, I quit my job. Of course, I was just so afraid and worried so much, especially financial reason. But I felt I can't live anymore like this. No sunshine, sitting in office the whole day. That's not life I want to live. And not only that, if I was alone at that time, I couldn't be brave. <laughs> but I met Patrick, and I met other friends, one of my farm farming club members. She, uh, yeah, she was very, she quit her exam uh, to be a teacher, which is very good job in Korea. Yeah, in Korea, teaching is a very high ranking job yeah, right? because I mean, it's stable it's for different. whole lifetime but mm -hmm. she she asked the same question when i'm happy when what kind of job make uh work makes me happy so she started <laughs> baking because she loves bread so much so instead of being teacher she became uh, a baker and now she's a uh, uh, bamboo worker i think you brought up the 
really good point, Suhi, which is um, you, it's really difficult to do it alone. So, you know, finding, uh, finding a partner is one way, but it, I mean, finding a, a group of people who have similar aims and who can push each other to be better and help each other when you, you know, fail, which is inevitable. Um, having this kind of core group of, of friends or people that you can um, bounce ideas off or, or help each other is really important. And it can be virtual. You know, I consider Robin, you know, you're one of those people in our life that helps push us to, to be better. And um, I hope in some ways we do the same um, for you, but have, having this network of people with, um, uh, with a uh, similar symbol, doesn't have to be similar aim, but similar kind of foundations of how you want to operate in this world. Um, it's, a, it's really helpful. We, we couldn't have done our work without that group of people in, you know, in the world. So finding that pe those people is important. We have um, kind of a follow-up question here in the Q&A uh, from Karen Sugawa. What were the difficulties and also rewards for moving place to place for the years you were both on tour? Which now seems, you know, almost hard to imagine that for all those years you, you were moving around and right now our lives are so static. One of the good pieces of advice I got, probably it was during the Tuesday night lectures when I was a student, is that if you want to be a creative person in your life, um, whether it's a writer or artist or whatever, uh, learn to cook. Learn to cook and learn to uh, use as little money as possible. And cooking is part of that because it saves you a lot of money if you learn to cook. And you can have a delicious, amazing food if you become a good cook. And it's so, <clears throat> yeah, Karen. Um, uh, difficulty was not was not having a um, place to come back to every day after your work. You know, I'm. I told Suhi, Suhi, all I want to do is have like my chair and a glass of whiskey at night and be able to relax. And just, and I can't, we couldn't do that for seven years. Um, you know, unless we're at someone's place who who had this kind of thing. So that for me, that difficulty was not having our own place and always relying on other people's places. Um, but again, there, that's part of the beauty too. You know, we got to experience so many different ways of living um, and we got to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. You know, you can't complain when you have a lifestyle like that, like this. You, you can't complain about anything it, because you can't control it. And so we realized really deeply that we can't control anything and so now we're more relaxed in our life when stuff goes wrong which it does a lot <laughs> you know that if we complain and blame and do this kind of stuff then we're going to make our life more miserable and so maybe the best thing i learned is not to complain <laughs> is to accept things and and you can you know control what you can control and, and realize that what you can control is a really small <laughs> you know, just your actions. That's all you can control. Um, so yeah, we learned that. That was a really good lesson. And we learned not to spend money and to cook. Um, and now Suhi cooks really nicely. <laughs> yeah. Uh, now we are staying in a uh, very, uh, how can I say, cool. A very cold, cold, temporary house that's not actually meant to be a house. But. 
but we appreciate a lot we have our space and daily life i can bake and cook and yeah many many time we talk about wow how luxurious life we are enjoying now how luxurious our life is even though most yeah. people wouldn't think so yeah my parents worry about so long <laughs> <laughs> we are very satisfied very happy with that yeah 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 being um, yeah appreciate it's very important that's a good question karen i know karen's about 10 years younger than us or more than 15 years really wow the students are so young these days <laughs> seems they get younger or is it that we get older you know you really can't generalize um about students especially especially in this webinar format where you can't see any of them but um the, the we do know karen yeah the lovely thing about san jose state I've, I've only been here for a year but i've had the pleasure of meeting so many of our students and they come in all ages all walks of life and really create this wonderful space um and we miss them when, when we can't when we can't be together. We have time for just one final question. I know Robin, you probably have something you you'd love to ask. Well, I think it's not so much a question is uh, a way to thank you both for being my sensei, you know, um, in Japan. Um, am I pronouncing that right, uh, Suhi? Hi, Robin Sensei. Sensei. And I didn't understand at first, why was everybody saying Robin Sensei? And then I, I realized it was uh, Robin, my, my teacher, and how in Japan, uh, I was just immediately respected because I was uh, Patrick's teacher. But what I wanted to uh, give back to you is, is actually both of you are my sensei. And I'm so just, I'm kind of choked up. I'm just, uh, thank you so much for sharing so much of your yourselves tonight, sensei. Thank you, Robin. Here's a happy story. <laughs> <laughs> this is Suhi's other art project, by the way. She leaves these happy stones everywhere she goes. So this I know. This I know. I do want to say that uh, Suhi and Patrick are going to join us in the graduate seminar and um, if you would like to continue the conversation, Elena, is there a way people could just write in? I can't see the chat, the um, question and answer for some reason, but if, if anyone wants to join us, uh, if you could email me, um, I will send them the, the link. And I know there's already others who, who have asked for that, but that would be great. Yes, absolutely. So anyone who wants to join Robin's class, please just, um, well, Let's see, how do you want it, Robin? Do you want me to post your email in the chat? That or would be actually, <laughs> like <laughs> Cynthia has shared the Zoom link to your class. Oh, um, beautiful. Say, thank, thank you, you Cynthia. Cynthia. She's awesome. always two steps ahead. Exactly. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> please feel free to, to walk this conversation over to Robin's grad seminar. And for those of you who can't be there, thank you for, for attending today. It's really been a wonderful evening with both of you, Patrick and Suhi. Um, and it's lovely to have you back virtually. We hope someday to see you back on, on campus and be able to, to follow up in person, so. We do too. I, uh, I miss that, that campus. It's a beautiful place to learn. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm sorry that I can't roll over into the grad seminar. I actually have to teach in half an hour, but it was you, really for, yeah. for asking the first question. Yahoo! A good one, too. <laughs> All, All right. right.
Thanks. And thank you so much for this great Tuesday night lecture series, as always, even when it's on Wednesday or Thursday or Friday, they're all great. Yeah, we're we're learning good. to be thank flexible. Um, so thank you all and have a good night and a good continuation to your conversation. Goodbye. Cheers.